So, generally speaking, whenever we are trying to understand a concept, so I'll quickly do a recap of how we went through. In the first session, we broadly focused on the understanding of the concept. So, I talk about three components about how it creates the whole world, creates the, the modes, create the pulls within the worlds, and creates the tracks along which we move. So, if, if the example of gears is not that clear, we could use the example of rail tracks. So, if there are rail tracks, a railway will move along a particular track. But the tracks are already laid, we can choose which track we want to go on. And today I'll talk a little bit more about the concept of free will. But then yesterday our focus was on the sociological application of this. How we can see society through the eyes of Shastra Chakshu. Basically, whenever we have knowledge, the jnana, generally the purpose of jnana is to give us Chakshu eyes. That's why the phrase jnana Chakshu or Shastra Chakshu comes often in scriptural study. With the Bhagavad Gita, Jnana Chakshu comes twice. It's coming in 30 chapters, it's going to come in the 15 chapter. So Jnana Chakshu, this, we use the eye, we use knowledge to inform our vision. Any knowledge, say if a mechanic hears a car's engine making a particular kind of noise, so knowledge is informing the vision, not so much the vision as the perception. That, okay, the sound indicates this is wrong. If a doctor sees a person with very mesh, with very uh, discolored nails, doctor will say, hey, maybe you've got, you got anemia. So knowledge informs the vision. So knowledge can inform our vision of the world. Knowledge can inform our vision of ourselves. So, we are understanding that we, yesterday with Jnana Jakshu, we focused on how to look at society. Today, we will focus on looking at self. So, we will talk more about personal application. That how can the concept of the gunas help us understand ourselves better? So, in society, just as I talked about how I there is knowledge in ignorance or intelligence in ignorance. And what happens by that? An idea may be foolish, but it can be justified using one's intelligence. And then people think that this is the right thing, this is the intelligent thing. They, uh, so that way, same thing can happen with us also at an individual level. So let's see how that happens. So the gunas are subtle forces that act individual level on people's minds. They also affect society. Now, society in one sense can be seen in two different ways. It's individuals. Ultimately, a society is nothing except made of individuals. But at the same time, there is what is used as mobs or masses. There are books written on the psychology of masses. A mob psychology it is called. So when a group of people come together, sometimes they go mad and they do things which they would not do as individuals. When there is a frenzy of violence that has come up, an ordinary person alone may not go and attack and kill someone. But when people come in a group, they may go mad. So violence is only one thing, but like the mob psychology, what we call as peer pressure is there. That everybody is doing it, so I need to do it. So that is there. So right now, we are going to focus on individuals. So in this, once we understand that the gunas are working, then it is helpful to consider that there are three levels of reality. That the soul, the mind, and the body slash the world. I'm putting the body and the world together because both of these are a part of the physical reality. Our body is a part of the physical reality. The mind cannot be seen. So we could almost put it this way that 
our body is a small set within the world. So the first level, if we want to grow spiritually, the first level of spiritual growth is to understand that I am different from physical matter. That there is more to me than my biology. There is more to me than my physical side. But now generally we say we are not our body. For most people when they say it, it is a very theoretical statement. It's just not comprehensive. One of my devotee friends from Russia, he said he was giving a class. And he told his class, you are not your body. And one person raised his hand. He said, yes. If I am not my body, then whose body am I? <laughs> <laughs> so the idea that there, there could be something beyond our body, that's very difficult to comprehend. So if I am not my body, am I someone else's body? What's going on? <laughs> so, and it is quite easy to identify with the body. Because if the body feels pain, we feel pain. So generally, how we identify with something, it's that thing's experience becomes our experience. So if we really love someone, if we're attached to someone, then if, that, if a parent is attached to the child, the child gets even a slight cut, the mother feels pain, isn't it? So when our emotions are invested in something, then that experience becomes our experience. So basically when we say bo body and identification with the body, any kind of identification with anything. Essentially, what does it mean? It's experience. Or their experience, it becomes our experience. So now Krishna says, Tam Stitikshasvabharata. So he says that, that heat and cold may be experienced by the body. But understand that you are not, that you are different from your body. So I was saying that, to say that I am not my body, it's quite difficult for most people to register that. So, especially when I start outreach in the West, I start by telling that there is more to us than our body. We are not our body, we live through our body. So we are not our body is very difficult for people to perceive. But we live through our body. That is something, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I am a being and I am living through this body. There is more to me than my body. So when we start perceiving that, we create a little distance between us and our physical side. And once that distance is created, then the, box, the sensations that come to the body, we accept that these are sensations, but that doesn't mean I have to act accordingly. So if I am feeling hot, does that mean immediately I have to go away from that place? Maybe, but it's also possible, let's see, hey, it's hot, it's uncomfortable, but it's tolerable. Sometimes it may not be tolerable. But basically what happens is, if we consider these three levels, the soul is here, the mind is here, the body is here, and the world is here. So now from the world, situations come. In the body, sensations come. In the mind, emotions come. So now we can get invested in any of these. Say for example, India loses a cricket match. Maybe India loses in the World Cup final. Uh, in one sense, we could say nothing has happened to us. But other sense, a lot has happened to us. Because why? If our emotions are invested in that, and we feel such a, because it feels such a heartbreak. But say, maybe India didn't win a gold medal in pistol shooting in Olympics. Well, maybe, okay, it's a mild disappointment. But nobody is hugely worked up about it. Because the emotions are not invested that much in that. Okay. So, at a basic level, we understand that if we can separate that I am the soul, and this is the body, this is the situation I am in. The more we can distance ourselves from it, the more we can choose how it affects us. It will affect, but how it affects us, we can choose. 
So, okay, it's cold right now, but we uh, can tolerate this cold for some time. But if I'm too much identifying with my body and bodily comfort, it's cold. I don't want this. I'm just going back into my room. I won't go out unless the temperature rises up. So, so what applies to our body? If we understand the concept of the gunas, we need to understand it applies for our mind also. That just as I am not my body, I am also not my mind. So we could say, just as there is physical environment, and within the physical environment, there is, we could say, the climate at a physical level. Similarly, we can say there is an emotional climate. So now sometimes the weather is weather is pleasant, sometimes the weather is unpleasant. But we understand this is what it is. I have to deal with it and I have to move on. So like that, Krishna is saying here that sometimes we will feel very enthusiastic, sometimes we feel very lethargic, sometimes we feel very reflective. These are things which come in our emotional climate. And they come because of the modes. So, prakasham cha pravrittim cha mogam eva cha pandava. So, we can say, the soul is here, the mind is here. Now, we could say, in the time that far, this is time, there will be phases that sometimes we may feel clarity. Sometimes we may feel energy. It could be hyper energy also. And sometimes we may feel lethargy. So these will come and go. But Krishna is saying, understand that this is just the emotional climate. This is this will come, this will go. So the idea of understanding the gunas is that I can distance myself from my mind. That I can keep myself away, understand that this is just, just like the weather goes up and down, similarly my mind goes up and down. Now conceptually, it's, it may be easy to understand, practically it's very difficult to implement this. And we'll think, of, we'll talk about how to implement it, but let's understand the concept. That when the mind has certain emotions within it, has certain desires within it, you know, those things keep coming and going. Are emotions and desires the same thing? Or are they different? Different? Because desires are... Uh, desires are things which we, uh, we think of achieving in future or something like that. And emotions are reactions to some events we have things. That's quite precise. Emotions and desires. Anyone want to add anything? You've heard him? What do you say? Emotions are reactions, desires are what we would like to achieve in future. Good. Anyone else? Emotions come from external environment more when we see something and get affected instantly. Desires will be cultivated. I'm sure emotions can also be cultivated. Okay. Like respect can be cultivated. Disrespect is also thoroughly cultivated. I said that we may have a culture, of, we may grow up in a culture of respecting our teachers. But say we come to college and we hang out a group where all kinds of snide remarks are made about teachers. Teachers are disrespected. And then we can learn disrespect, isn't it? So certainly you can say negative emotions can be learned. So positive can also be learned. So, but I agree with your point, broadly speaking. Let's look at it this way. When we talk about the soul and the mind. So, here, when we perceive something, we perceive through the Jnana Indriyas. 
So when we perceive something, what arises within is emotions. So emotions are more of responses to some stimuli. Now I'll complicate this a little bit more soon, but let's first start with simple. So desires are what arise from inside, which are so these are more responses or reactions. Whereas desires are more associated with actions. Now we may not all act on our desires. But the, that means the way things are, we feel something about it. And then we want to do something about it. So, Dhyayato Vishayan Pumsaha Sangas Teshu Pajayati. So, Dhyayato is information coming in. Then, Sangas, attach, hey, that's nice. That is emotion. Sangat Sanjayate Kamaha. Kama is a desire. So, basically, Generally, when we perceive something, say, now, you may think, uh, maybe tonight I don't want to get prasad, I'm not very hungry. But you go down off this program and you find there's a feast over there. Then suddenly, uh, hunger comes. <laughs> 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 so what has happened is, that when certain perception comes, hey, that's nice. And from that's nice, I want it. So generally, desires follow emotions. Desires come from emotions. Desires are ways of dealing with emotions. That's a simple understanding. This can be, we can go into much more complicated things. But I'll go only to one level more of complication. That the mind itself, when the gunas affect someone, or gunas affect us, and the gunas don't affect everyone in the same way. When I used, when I started going to America in 2014, for the first time, I've been going for 10 years now, I used to give a lot of contemporary examples, I used to give examples of cricket also. So my program organizers, especially those who are in America, those who are organizing programs for Americans, they told me, don't use cricket examples in America. I said, why, why is that? They said, for Americans, cricket is an insect, it is not a game. <laughs> you know, you know, crickets are those insects which make noises in the night. So they have no idea of cricket as a game. For them, baseball is very common, basketball is common. So you know, say I was at the cricket ground. Are there grounds for crickets in India? <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is that we all have inside our mind some impressions. So when some perceptions come in, when some information comes in, it has to trigger some some impression within us. Otherwise, there is no reaction. So when some emotion comes up, so if I see some food item which I don't recognize at all, then maybe I may not feel any desire for it. If I am hungry, then any food item doesn't matter. But if I'm not really hungry, then I see a food item. If I've never heard about the food item, then I've seen food item. What is this? What is this? If it doesn't trigger anything inside me, then no emotion might come. So basically, when emotions arise, they are a result of both. Let's put it this way. When they come in, there is an external perception. This is external. And there is an internal impression. And from this arise both emotions and eventually desires. So if somebody has, say, no interest in horror movies, then if they pass by a movie theater, there's no horror movie is going on. It has no, there's no impression within it, they will not even be attracted to it. But somebody likes that genre of movies. Then as soon as a horror movie, thinking of a horror movie will give them pleasure. <laughs> it's peculiar, but it's like sometimes people's lives are so boring that any emotion is better than no emotion. So even if it is an emotion of horror, I want it. So there is an outer perception that triggers an inner impression. So the gunas, they affect us according to the kind of impressions we have. 
and when we say a person is in sattva guna that means their prominent impressions are sattvic so a person is prominently sattva guna when they come to a new city maybe they will go and look at okay where are the libraries over here where are the bookstores over here where are the parks over here where are the thoughtful people where i can find some like minded people where there's a temple over here if somebody's primary impression is in sattva guna they may wonder where are the movie theaters over there where are the, the discotheques over there if somebody's primary impression is tamo guna where are the bars over here hmm? where are the brothels over here hmm? so things like that so the, so that means these gunas they create impressions within us or rather there are impressions within us impressions are associated with different modes so the impressions within us the sanskrit word for impression is samskar actually the samskar word has two different meanings one itself as it is impression but the other is also specific ceremonies to create impressions so like there is vivah samskar there is antya samskar there is a namakaran samskar so what is the idea that those kind of ceremonies they create impressions inside us and those impressions actually are healthy so we bring a group of american yoga students to india every year we take them to randavan rishikesh the govardhan eco village so most of them are women young women not young 35 40 so they are in that age group so they when they come they also they for them it's not a just a bhakti experience it's like a india experience they want to experience india so one of one, one trip they said that the we want to experience the indian wedding see america and indian weddings are like legendary all over the world i got they call it the big fat indian wedding because in america when somebody's wedding is there in india what happens is those who are organizing the wedding they pay for people to come but in america if there somebody is wedding you have to come at your own expense you have to find your own lodging and you come and you go and still people come and normally a big wedding is where it's 200 300 people but in india there are 1000 people 2000 people 5000 people also and even the biggest wedding in in america is for one and a half two hours nobody can wait more than that like, americans can't imagine a game going for 5 days is cricket match goes on friday how can you play five days and then the maximum game is 80 90 minutes that's all finish more so even wedding is at 2 3 hours so in india weddings go on for 2 3 days there's a sangeet on the previous day and then the ceremony and then the reception so the, after the our india trip one of these we asked the various people what impressions they like what places they like what it like and different people said different amazing things You know, many of them said they had heard about Taj Mahal. They went to Taj Mahal, but then we went there one, and went there one. We have this uh, Kusum Sarovar. Has it even been there? Kusum Sarovar. It's a beautiful place, and especially if in the evening you go, it's lit for beautiful. Is it? Kusum Sarovar is actually more beautiful than Taj Mahal also. Like that, they had different impressions. But three, four of the girls said that the wedding was the most memorable thing. And then I asked them. Hey, what did you find so special about the wedding? I said after uh, they didn't they were not there for three days. They just for the main day of the wedding. Oh, if there are th- thousand people, the thousand plus people there for the wedding, there are so many ceremonies going on that after attending such a wedding, you can never forget that you are married. Now, <laughs> 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 now we wonder if somebody is married. How can you forget that you are married? <laughs> that is obviously you cannot forget that but it is somebody just gone to a court and signed some legal document with just two witnesses there is not much of a impression created in the mind <laughs> so people can very easily forget i am married <laughs> so the vivah samskar this is not a endorsement of all the huge amount of wealth that is spent on the ceremony but the idea is the whole ceremony creates an impression as well in the time of initiation the essence of the initiation is just receiving the mantra but when there is when diksha is done there is a whole ceremony 
and that ceremony creates that gravitas. Yeah, actually, I have committed now. I have to live in this way. So the idea there are there are ceremonies also to create impressions. So when we do our sadhana, when we do kirtan, when we attend class, beyond the specific things that we are learning in the classes, just coming in this environment and discussing Krishna Tattva, that is creating a samskar within us, and that is good for us. That when we come and this is the process by which we grow spiritually. So creating healthy samskaras is one of the most powerful ways to change the prominent modes that are influencing us. So I may be in Rajoguna, but if I repeatedly bring myself into sattvic environment, that will create a sattvic samskar within me, and then that will start getting activated. So I'll come to that more soon. But I, I hope the idea, basic idea of samskar is clear. That it is both external end of the ceremonies or activity that create the impressions and also refers to the impressions inside us. Now, when it refers to the impressions inside us, quite often the word samskar is used negatively. It can be used positively also. Oh, I have some dark samskars, I have some negative samskars. So, in that sense, you can write about samskar as some scar. <laughs> so, everybody has some or the other scar within them. And how do we know what is the kind of some scar that is there within us? Say, right now, some, suppose somebody is behind me and they want to talk something with me. And from behind, they tap on my shoulder. And they tap on my shoulder gently, ah, if I scream. Say, what happened? You know, I just tapped it on my shoulder. And I say, okay, you know, actually, I had fallen on this shoulder, I got shoulder sprain over here. Oh, okay. And they understand. So, what happens is, if there's an injury, then a small stimulus triggers a great response, a strong response. So similarly, what are the samskars within us? The presence of samskar, how do we understand it? That is by, through the small stimulus, large reaction. So, Somebody has say, some scars associated with alcoholism. Then when they come to a party, as soon as they see a bottle of alcohol, Sarva Dharma and Parityaja Maya make up Sharan. They are talking with their boss. In their mind, their boss body changes with a bottle of alcohol. So, so small stimulus, strong response. Sometimes in English, they, there's a saying. Oh, have I touched a nerve here? Have you, have you heard this phrase? Have I touched a nerve? What it means is that, like, say, a somebody is shaving a head, or somebody is cut, be cutting a beard, shaving their face. Then, if we touch a nerve, then it causes pain and it bleeds. So, have I touched a nerve means that's the idea of saying that. Have I have I said something that has triggered some un unpleasant memory within me? Let's take a some scar. So, if somebody speaks something, somebody does something, and if our reaction is disproportionate. The, that is a reasonable indication that there is a samskar over there. So we can say some of us may have some scars associated with anger, some of us may have some scars associated with lust, some of us may have some scars associated with greed, some of us may have some scars associated with jealousy, some of us may have some scars associated with fear that somebody was bitten by a dog in their childhood. And then as soon as you see a dog, it's like a tiny, sweet little dog, immediately still there is food. So it's like, these are the, all samskaras that we have. So basically, now we cannot deny the presence of the samskaras. They are there very much with us. But, if we understand it properly, then we can address it. So what Krishna is saying is, let's see this simply as the function of the mind. Sometimes we feel enthusiastic, sometimes we feel lethargic. All okay. Rather than, okay, I feel lethargic, let me just give up everything. Now instead of that, what do you do? Okay, this is just, a, just a, something has been triggered in my mind and because of which I am feeling like this, this will come, this will go. So basically, so when we are attached, the soul and the mind they are so close to each other that whatever the mind's emotion becomes my emotion. Whatever the mind's desire 
becomes my desire. But if we can distance ourselves, so if we create this distance, then what happens is, this is mind's emotion. This is not my emotion. Now, that does not necessarily mean that we can deny or reject that emotion. But instead of saying, I am feeling angry right now. My mind is feeling angry. We just change the wording like that. Now, that, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to suppress it. We have to deal with it appropriately. But Krishna is saying, Udasinavad asinam. In the second part of the words, Udasinavad. Be as if detached. So this word Udasinavad is very interesting. Udasinavad, as if detached. So I, I think I mentioned that this will be a test of your vocabulary also. Or you will grow your vocabulary over here. So have you these, heard these two words? Has anyone heard this word disinterested? Yes. You have heard this word? Yeah, have you heard this word uninterested? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, have any of you been interested in the difference between the two? <laughs> <laughs> okay. How many of you think there is some difference? How many of you think there is no difference? How many of you think the difference does not make any difference? <laughs> Okay, any difference? Yes, sir. Okay, how many think there's no difference? How many think it doesn't make any difference? <laughs> okay, fine. So, okay, those of you think it's a difference, what do you think is the difference? Interested means you are not interested. And disinterested means you are neutral, you are not care. Good, you should apply for GRE. <laughs> not necessarily. It's good. You also want to say the same thing? Okay, so not having any interest, that is uninterested. Now, the words may not always be used in this sense, but there's a broad meaning. Disinterested is, so un, uninterested is basically the opposite of interest, and I, I don't find it interesting. But disinterested is more associated with, have you heard this word? Vested interests. Hmm? Vested interest means that you have some selfish interest in it. You know, you, like, uh, if you have some vested interest, you want things to come in a particular way. So disinterested is a square. I have no vested interest in this. So the idea is, whether it is go this way, this way, it doesn't matter to me. I am neutral. Not that I have no interest, but I have no interest in a particular judgment or a particular outcome over here. So let's consider a game we all know, cricket. Let's consider the umpire in cricket. Uh, should the umpire be uninterested or disinterested? Disinterested. Mm. Say the baller bowls and the batsman tries to hit and the batsman mits, misses and the ball goes and hits the legs and all the players are like, wow's that? And the umpire says, you know, I was not watching the ball. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know why? I'm not interested. Well, if you're not interested, there won't be an umpire, isn't it? But the umpire should not be uninterested. But the umpire should be disinterested. See, the umpire is having vested interest. The umpire, what the umpire might do is, one team's all the appeals, if they like that team, all out, 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 out. Other team's appeals, they don't like, not out, not out, not out, not out. And that's why nowadays in cricket matches, they always have a third country's umpire. If two players are playing, then from neither country, the host country will not provide the umpires. Somebody, third, third person with the umpire. So the idea is that the umpire should be disinterested. And when they are disinterested, what does it mean? That means that a disinterested, um, like um, disinterested umpire, they will evaluate appeals not based on the volume, but the validity. Just because all the fingers are playing, how's that? All of them make a loud noise. So, how are they also confident that this player is out? So, we should make it out. No, not like that, is it? The volume should not determine the decision of the umpire. The, it should be based on the validity, actually. Is the ball going to go and hit the stumps? 
So similarly, Krishna is saying, we need to become an inner umpire of our emotions. So just because an emotion is coming very strongly within us, it's speaking very loudly, the volume is very high, that does not necessarily mean that we have to accept it. We have to look at its validity. Somebody speaks something to me which makes me very angry, or rather, which triggers anger within me. Now, because that anger has come, it's something which says, yell at that person, put them in their place, shout at them. That urge may come within me. But, I have to consider not just the, just because this particular urge is coming so strongly within me, doesn't necessarily mean I have to accept, I have to evaluate its validity. No, if this person has made this mistake for the first time, then maybe I just need to explain to them and then see if they understand. This person is repeating it again and again and again. Then maybe they need to be chastised. So basically with respect to our emotions, so just to go back to this, generally speaking with respect to the mind, we have two approaches to it. Generally we talk about control the mind. And that is required at times to control the mind. But that is not the only thing we need to do. Sometimes we need to comfort the mind. So the mind can be like a child who is filled with fear. And say if the child is crying because of fear, then the mother just puts the hand on the child, cracks the child. <laughs> well, okay, if there are some thieves in the house, the thieves, we don't hide from the thieves, then try silencing, gagging the child is okay. But afterward, the mother has to pacify the child. Everything's all right, that noise was there, but that everything is safe. No need to feel, no need to feel agitated. So, the emotion needs to be addressed properly. So, similarly for us, with respect to emotions, so I'll make three points and then we'll have some questions. So, when we say, uh, you have to evaluate based on merit or validity. What does it mean? Whether it is emotion, and I, I'll focus on emotions, but emotions may eventually grow to desires. But by one, ex, one extreme is to just repress it. Somebody is making us angry, but I think my willpower is, I will never even show slightest of displeasure. That is my rigid, iron kind, ironclad kind of self sense control. Okay. The other is express. Whatever happens, every small thing, I just yell at the other person. Now, if we express, others burn. You know, we can't do that all the time. If, let's, let's consider the emotion of anger primarily. Over. But if we repress, what is going to happen? We burn inside. And eventually, that person is going to do some small thing and then we explode, not because of the small thing, but because of the 1,177 things that we tolerated in the, or repressed in the past. So, in between is process. We don't repress, we don't express, we process. So, process means again, evaluate on validity. Be like umpire. The umpire is meant to process. So, udasi, navadasi. So, these are, are, so whatever emotion is coming within me, like say, so during our japa, if you feel sleepy, now there could be various possibilities. One could be broadly, you can say there are three possibilities. Actually, we are tired, we are sick, we are bored. Now, now we could also be able to say another could be, we are just distracted. And because we are distracted, we find nothing interesting, we feel sleepy, whatever it is. So now, if we are tired, maybe we need to tolerate for some time. But we need to address it, we can't just crush that. If every day we are feeling tired, then maybe we need to do some practical changes. Maybe I need to sleep on time. If I am sick, I can't just crush my, crush my tiredness and the sleepiness that is coming from me. If I'm feeling bored, then maybe I have to find, read something about, like, about chanting which inspires me more. Then that boredom goes away. If I'm feeling distracted, then maybe I need to keep some attractive picture of Krishna in front of me. Maybe do something which will trigger my interest, focus. 
So basically here, you could say practical physical action will be required. Here, maybe intellectual or mental inner action will be required. So there are different situations, different approaches are required. We cannot have just if I am sick and because of which I am not able to stay awake. And at that time I just use my rigid self-control and still I stay awake and I show no emotion. I do no action. And maybe that is good at that time, but afterward it could be very harmful. Like somebody has some symptoms of some disease and they repress the symptoms. That's not good. So when we process means, process means we evaluate, we find the cause. And then after that we find come up with a with the action plan, a course of action. What do I do for the evil? So the gunas, when we say this is okay, now Rajoguna is coming. Raj, this is this particular desire is coming because of Rajoguna. Okay. But Rajoguna itself is not bad. Tamaguna itself is not bad. Sometimes I'm feeling sleepy. That means I'm tired. I need to sleep, isn't it? So the key thing is we focus on our inner world and try to analyze what is the cause. Now we may say, I don't have time to all do all these things. Each time my emotion comes, can I go about doing this? No, we can't. But if we see some regular patterns in our emotions, if we find that we are becoming irritable, the small, small things are irritating us, then we need to evaluate. Maybe there's some, 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 some scar over here. Just saying, I'm saying I'm a short-tempered person. That's not very helpful. Okay, but okay, what is triggering my temper? And then how can I deal with it? So that's why Udasina Vadasina, be as if a detached observer. Become an observer of your emotions, become a processor of your emotions. Now this is more of a jnana approach. This is also, a, I talk about two ways in which we, we can deal with the gunas. One is analysis and the other is devotion. So till now I talk about analysis, now we could go much more into the subject. But broadly, the principle is that we distance ourselves from it. And then we observe, we evaluate based on merit. If we are too close to it, then whatever the mind says, immediately we'll do it. Like if uh, if the umpire identifies very strongly with a particular team, then they will be biased, either consciously or unconsciously. But if the if the umpire is not very invested in the particular team, <coughs> then they can evaluate based on merit. So this is one way. Let's go to text 1426, where it gives an approach of bhakti. Most of you know this verse probably, so let's look at it. Maam chayo avyapichare, you know. Avyapichare means without deviation. Bhakti yogena sevate, one who serves me with devotion. So, guna, such a person, by, among the gunas, samatit yaita. Samatit means to go beyond, to transcend. And then that person comes to the Brahma Guyaya Kalpate. That person will come to the spiritual platform. So the gunas affect at the material level. But through bhakti we can reach the spiritual level. So, so let's recite this verse. Maam chayo vyabhicharena. Maam chayo vyabhicharena. Bhakti yogena sevate. Bhakti yogena sevate. Sagunan samati yaitan. Sagunan samati yaitan. Brahma bhuyaya kalpate. Brahma bhuyaya kalpate. Let's recite it all together only once we don't understand. Maam chayo vyabhichare na. Bhakti yogena sevate. Sagunan samati yaitan. So Krishna is giving us a different approach. He says, first by analysis you can understand that the modes are affecting my mind, I am different from my mind. And to some extent it is important to realize this difference. So basically you can say, understand that there is a difference between me and my mind. This is Jnana to some extent. But Bhakti is about, it's to make a difference. It's not to understand a difference, but make a difference in my mind. That means, 
is to put it diagrammatically say this is the soul and this is the mind now i want to go in this direction my mind wants to go in the opposite direction so i understand this is just my mind's desire mind is desire coming up it will stay it will go so i keep pushing on in this direction persist over here. but when what bhakti does is i want to go in this direction and we change our mind so that i want to go in this direction my mind also wants to go in this direction mai asakta manaha i make my mind attached to this so how does this happen when he says krishna says that bhakti yoga in sevate what it means is that there are already samskaras within our mind now the samskaras themselves cannot be deleted fortunately they can be overridden we cannot delete them but we can override them and that's why you have said oh we bichare you know what does it mean it just keep practicing bhakti repeatedly as much as you can so have any of you heard of this thing in mumbai <laughs> small thing is there <laughs> which everybody in the world knows about so suppose somebody on that phone has visited a website called bollywood.com maybe they have visited a 100 times now whenever they type b what happens on the browser bollywood.com now suppose they come to a spiritual talk like this and they hear about the bhagavad gita and they want to know what is the bhagavad gita and they go to their browser and start typing bhagavad gita and they type b and what happens bollywood.com comes but they didn't want to go to bollywood.com but bollywood.com has come because of the samskar in their browser hello <laughs> <laughs> the browser history is like our mind samskars so for example you know whenever we feel insecure you know whenever say we go to college and we are working and we meet somebody who is far more brilliant than us and we say how can i even compete against this person and if they this person is there that person always get the raise always get the promotion always get the best job but so how can i compete and start feeling insecure and say maybe in our past whenever i feel insecure my sol- our solution is we just start watching some movies is go and do some surfing on the internet just try to forget it all some some kind of escapism remember we talked about movies as escapism illusion earlier so i so said that was our default response so whenever i feel fear when i feel insecurity my default response is what some movies just forget it find some form of escapism say through movies like movie clips on shorts or insta reels or whatever now when i start practice when we start practicing what the then we understand that okay say if i hear some kirtans if i hear some good class then also i feel maybe i say if i hear some soothing kirtans if i sing some bhajans i feel i feel calm i feel centered so now that is another way to deal with that insecurity so quite often see whenever we indulge it may be indulging maybe in overeating it may be just net surfing whatever it is we often think it's because of uncontrollable desires the desires are so strong and then when we can use this control then we say just oh my be my will power is so weak i resolve i won't do it but still i did it now it is possible that is because of uncontrollable desires but it could also be because of unbearable emotions that means at that time i feel so insecure i feel so worried that i just can't bear it inside there is so much uh, negativity so much fear so much anxiety that i need some relief so it's not so much because say the movie is so good or say if somebody is surfing on the net and watching something obscene it's not because they are so attracted to that that now it's possible that the pull of that can become irresistible and addictive but it's entirely possible that there is some unbearable emotion within us and you just want to get away from that emotion 
after somebody has spoken very hurtfully to us and we are feeling very terrible about it. And then, just, I want to get away from this. How do I get away? My past responses, somebody's past, okay, just surf on the net. Find something stimulated. So it could be now in this case, it's not so much weak willpower as just unhealthy samskaras, unhealthy impressions. So it's like our mind's browser has got certain impressions. As soon as B is typed, Bollywood comes with auto complete. So it's not that Bollywood is so irresistible. It's not that when you go to Bollywood.com, you find something so attractive. But just because we have visited Bollywood.com in the past, it is going to come automatically. So now here, what can be done? Uh, with respect to our browser, you know, we can people can surf in incognito. You can install a VPN. You can just delete the browser. You can just format the phone. But none of these options are there with respect to the mind. And there is no deleting the browser. For the mind, there is no incognito mode. You know, <laughs> every thought that we entertain, every action that we do, it's going to create an impression. Some may be stronger, some might be weaker, but everything creates impressions. So now there is only one way to deal with it. Or rather, two parts to it, but only one way. Basically, we have to type the full bhagavadgita.com. So if I type B and Bollywood comes, still type Bhagavad Gita. It may take some effort. There, this B, press enter, you are already there in Bollywood. But here you have to type 12 letters. It can seem like climbing Mount Everest at that time. But just do it. Suppose somebody visits bhagavadgita.com 10 times. Then what will happen? Next time they type B, Bollywood.com may still come as the first autocomplete. But Bhagavadgita.com will come as a second autocomplete. It may be lower down, but it will be there. And if it is second autocomplete, still it is easier to just go down and click that. So if somebody just keeps visiting Bhagavadgita.com repeatedly, then what will happen? Bhagavadgita.com will come eventually as the first autocomplete. Now, if somebody has visited Bollywood.com 100 times, and then they just visit Bhagavadgita.com 50 times. If the recent 50 times, what will happen is, then that 50 times may make this the first autocomplete. But suppose somebody has visited Bollywood.com 1000 times. Then 50 times visiting may not make it the first one. So we don't have to compare with others because each of us has our kind of samskaras. For some people, the change may happen faster for some people, the change may happen slower, but the change is happening. So basically, what Krishna says, this is earlier 635, so I'll conclude with this. Krishna says to manage the mind, we need two things, Abhyasa and Vairagya. So now these words can mean many different things in different contexts, but in this context of samskaras, Vairagya means when B leads to Bollywood, as autocomplete. So, don't go there. So, why rag? It will come as autocomplete, but I don't have to go there. Abhyasa means Bhagavad Gita. Type the full thing. So, whenever I feel, whenever somebody hurts me, whenever I feel fear, my automatic tendency will be, we just surf something on the net and try to find something to help me to feel good. Okay, that tendency is there, but why rag? Okay, this is not what I'm doing. What I'm going to do is, let me, let me just have some kirtan in my phone and just maybe have it as a shortcut and start to press it and just have a earphone, start hearing, singing with it, go to some secluded place and just start singing. Just keep singing very softly in our mind, whatever, till we start feeling a little bit. And then what will happen is the fresh impressions will be created. So basically, like I said, sometimes the mind needs to be comforted. If the child, the child is crying because of fear, then shut up. That's not very helpful. Now, sometimes it may be required. But generally, the mind needs to be comforted. But the child generally. Calm down, calm down. So basically, B abhyasa is persistence. Vairabhya is abstinence. 
You heard the word abstain from something, not do it, so abstinence. So now persistence and abstinence, both of these together will lead to transcendence. Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpate. So P-A-T. We need to sometimes pat our mind towards change. We don't force our mind, we don't crush our mind. So persistence and abstinence will take us toward transcendence. So each of us, whatever be our conditionings from the past, so we don't have to ever lose hope. So we may have Rajasik or Tamasik conditionings, that's okay. We may have particularly even addictive desires. But this is a process. It's a process that will work for everyone. But the key thing is, how long it will take, it depends on how deep rooted our impressions. So, but if we just keep doing this, we are changing the impressions within us. So, <clears throat> this is how Bhakti Yoga is universal. It works for everyone. No matter what the conditionings be there in someone's mind, they can be changed. I was talking with one devotee. He was in the war. It's sometimes we wouldn't have very dark stories. And you can understand him that good people do bad things. This devotee, you know, long ago there was a war between Bosnia and Croatia. I mean, one of you may, may, may not have heard about it also. It's when, when my, my pre college days. So, this devotee was actually a general in the, uh, in the Bosnian army. And they were told just go and kill Croatian people. Uh, and they were told not only kill them, but he said he's the first in front of the parents who kill all the children. Then after you kill the children, then in front of the men, rape the women. And after that, you kill the women and then you kill the men. The idea is cause maximum pain. Like this is what genocide is all about. It's horrendous. So he, he had some conscience. He said, how can I do this? So, but he didn't know everybody was doing it. And the, the idea over there was that if you don't do this, you are a deserter. If you are a deserter, you will be killed. So somehow he felt something, I shouldn't be doing this. He had a moral awakening, he left. And he was sneaking through. That's the time he met some devotees. And the devotees helped him come out of that country, he went to a different place. And he said, he, he said, I was also, as a soldier, I was a killer. But we were trained to kill other soldiers. Not just, not just go and kill civilians all. So he said, this was something which even I couldn't accept. But that devotee, he said, I met him in Mayapur. Or he met another devotee, and then he was telling the story that, you know, he was in Mayapur and he read, he actually read, before that he read the Bharat Mahara story. The Bharat story, he was in order to step on an ant also. So he said he was in Mayapur, and Mayapur is a lot of mosquitoes. So somehow that day he didn't have a mosquito net. So the mosquitoes were biting him, his whole body was like swollen. And he said, this, this devotee asked him, why didn't you ask for a mosquito net? He said, you just nasty, I don't want to disturb you. But the, this devotee woke up and he called somebody that fire to matter to that, that place management and they got a mosquito net for him late at night. He said, I have done enough killing for this lifetime. I won't kill even a mosquito net. Now, you can see that amount of transformation of how, you know, whatever condition things we have, most of us are not killed anymore. So, Bhakti has this capacity of changing conditions to any degree. So, a person who was like a cold blooded killer, that person doesn't want to kill even a mosquito. So, if we allow the process of Bhakti to work, what does it mean? We don't get discouraged. It's persistence, abstinence. Persistence, that, that persistence means, like again, that evaluate based on validity, not on volume. Volume is there, abstain from validity, just act. And that way, each one of us, our conditionings can be transformed. And we can rise towards transcendence beyond all the modes. So I'll summarize what I discussed today. That broadly, we discussed the concept of, first was distancing. Distancing from our mind. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, the soul is different from the mind, the mind is different from the body, and the body is in one sense different from the environment, the world. So just as we understand the situations may sometimes need to be tolerated, 
the sensations may need to be tolerated the emotions also need to be tolerated now what does tolerance mean tolerance does not mean passive what we discuss about this is that udasi navad udasi means what disinterested disinterested means like umpire the umpire evaluates based on not the volume of the appeal but the validity of the appeal so that means when we have certain emotions like anger the way we deal with them is not that we repress them not that we simply express them but what do we do we process them so here we discussed about how when emotions arise now they arise because of there is external there are sensations perceptions whatever is coming in but there are also internal impressions so it arises because of a combination of the two of them so the first level is is distance yourself this is just the mind i don't have to take it so serious this will come this will go so basically this approach of distancing from jnana it is more of tolerating the samskaras tolerating means they'll come they'll be there for some time they'll go like religious tolerance means okay these people are following a religion that is different from me i don't necessarily like it but they're there for some time i'll interact with them sometimes let them have their own way of living i don't care so tolerate them they'll come they will stay they will go but tolerating alone is not enough bhakti bhakti is about transforming the samskaras so transforming the impressions within us and how do we transform the impressions we cannot delete them but we discuss these three things what is it persistence persistence is abhyas so bollywood.com is there just focus on getting bhagavadgita.com at the end so repeatedly just do the make the healthier action just repeatedly do the right thing a is abstinence so as much as possible when the negative urge comes up the urge to repeat our previous unhealthy tendency to act just distance yourself from it and last is by this we can get to transcendence so the mind and it sometimes needs to be controlled but sometimes it needs to be comforted so this is pat is a way of comforting it so the idea is when we relapse when we indulge if it is because of uncontrollable desires then we need to boost our will power but if it is because of unmanageable emotions uncom unbearable emotions then we can't just suppress it we need to find out a healthier way to create positive emotions when we do that each one of us can be healed so our conditioning no matter how strong they are krishna is stronger than our strongest conditions and bhakti can uplift even the worst among us that is the base of our basis of our hope and confidence thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions or comments can speak loudly if you have a mic so going to under the emotional topic we discussed about uh, this two extreme topic that is depression and expression and uh, then we have to find a middle that gets the process so from here i'm asking you this is the right process or not for us say So, so the next one is that was uh, mistreated me or misbehaved with me. So there are two. So there are two extreme options: the the explicit to that person or implicit to me. Now, what if I find this process that I don't genuinely want to express to the person, but I kind of implicit by thinking that perhaps the way he mistreated me, I will never ever go and mistreat someone like this. So in this case, it's like a win-win situation. Like I'm not exactly mistreating him, nor I'm burning him out. Not I'm calling myself, but just finding a middle way. Is it? That's one one way of dealing with it. It's not the only way. In the sense that, if say if we are in a position of authority or responsibility, 
say if I am a preacher and somebody else also a preacher, and I find as a preacher that person gives very dismissive or hurtful answers. Somebody says, "What do you think about this particular teacher or whatever?" And then that person gives some answers which hurt people. And I may feel upset. Why this person speaking like this? If I am in also, if I am the, I am the equal, I am similar position. I also have responsibility for the audience. Then I may take that lesson. I will never speak like this. But that may not be enough. I may have to tell that person. You know, if you cannot speak like this, people will go away. You know, more than the people you are getting, you are losing people much more. And that person doesn't listen. I may have to go to their authority. So process basically means find out what is the best way to deal with things. You know, in the morning I am doing a series of talks on when things go wrong, the temple. So find out the actionable cause and deal with that cause. So we have to look at our particular, what is our particular role over there? See, generally, when our response is to be determined, it is determined by our guna and our karma. Now, guna karma can be very different things. In this particular case, it's our disposition and our position. So, if somebody is a Brahm, and more of a Brahminical mode of person, okay, things are going on, let them go on, let me live with it. But that's okay. Say, if somebody is robbed, and he is walking along the road, now we may, we may help the rob, where the person, we may, may, may take, help them report to the police, or comfort them, or whatever. Or we may say, this is not my business, I may just go on. I got the best response, but that's okay. But if in front of a police somebody is robbed, and that person says it's none of my business, well, that is your only business. Stopping crime, isn't it? So it depends on our role. So I should not do like this is a very good constructive response, but that's not the only constructive response. It could be that okay, right now I will not, I not speak against this, but maybe later on when I am calmer, this person is calmer, I will need to talk to this person more. Sometimes people are working together on a regular basis in services which are high stake, where there are likely to be differences of opinion and mistakes can have serious costs. Then it is a good thing, good strategy to have some time when both of them meet and maybe first do something sattvic or spiritual. Maybe they meet for an hour, the first 15 20 minutes do something sattvic or spiritual. And after that, they are very, when they are both calm, then they express their concerns. You know, when you did this, I felt like this. Maybe you smaller than like this. Maybe you did like this, if you like this. So it's required. Like this. So there. So tolerance is not uh, tolerance does not necessarily mean passivity. Uh, tolerance itself is a big subject, but tolerance is Krishna, for example, as Arjuna tolerate Tams, this is a bad. But that does not mean Krishna is telling Arjuna. The Kauravas did all terrible things to you. It's tolerated. Why are you fighting against them? You have the fighting. That is not the meaning of tolerance. Tolerance for Arjuna in the Kurukshetra battlefield means that you have your dharma of fighting. And now you have to fight against Bhishma and Drona. That's very difficult for you. But because they have chosen the side of Adharma, you have to fight against them. And whatever pain you may feel, you have to endure that. So tolerate essentially means two distinct things. Keep big things big. And keep small things small. So you could say it's maybe this is first, this is second. Or that may be first, but both are cyclic. When we keep small things small, we can keep big things big. When we keep big things big, we can keep small things small. Say for example, if I'm giving a class right now, and say one of your phone rings. Now it's annoying, but it's possible we might just forget to bring, put, put the phone in silent mode. Like at that time, I just yell at that person. And what is going to happen by that is, basically everybody will get distracted with it. Everybody will get distracted with the subject. Maybe at the end of the class, the only thing people remember <laughs> is the preacher yelled at the person. <laughs> Isn't it? No? So that small thing became big. But on the other hand, suppose somebody's phone is ringing, and they are not just turning off the phone only. Yes, it keeps ringing, keeps ringing, keeps ringing. Then it's not a small thing, isn't it? Then politely but firmly. Can you attend to that phone? Can you silence that phone? I need to take that phone. Can you go out? 
So we have to, so we have to, so when we come here, the big thing is, we have to focus on Krishna and his message. So we have to ourselves do some homework beforehand to know what is the big thing, what is the small thing. And based on that, we act. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you for the class. Can I have some? Uh, thank you for the class. Uh, uh, one point about dispensing ourselves. So, one, so there are two methods which you told you which we can uh, deal with situations. So, one is distancing from the body, distancing from the mind, and then the devotional aspect, so, focusing on Krishna. So, so the, uh, but practically, how to uh, how to apply this or understand this? Because in distancing ourselves from body, okay, that uh, maybe I can uh, grab, okay, that uh, okay, I am not this body. Something happened. Is matter. But distancing from the mind, it is something like intel by intelligence you are thinking, okay, why did I do this emotion? Why what this happened? Sometimes while writing diary, this thing comes. Or uh, so this is so how to uh, think myself distant? Am I distancing from the mind? Also then the devotional aspect also. How can we uh, keep aside everything and then just. Uh, Put our concentration to Krishna or divert our attention to it. Okay. So, how do we distance ourselves? It generally has to begin somewhere where we ourselves find the behavior unacceptable. If we sit down right now for five minutes, we get probably 50 things in us which we want to improve. But maybe out of them, 40 things are, okay, it's good if I improve them. But if I don't, it's not a bad, big thing. But maybe if maybe four or five of them, five, six among them would be, you know, maybe I didn't need to work on this. But maybe, maybe there are two, three of those which, you know, I absolutely should not be doing this. How can I do this? So you know, we may not feel like that constantly, but we all have some aspects in that. So those aspects of us, which we ourselves can't talk, can't want, we don't want to live with. So we should start with those. That is, so if it is already this is unacceptable, then see, we all have certain boundaries which come from our cultural upbringing. And when we transgress those boundaries, nobody may have composed those boundaries, but they are there for us. When I get angry, I may yell at people, but I'm not going to speak foul words. Mm -hmm. Or when I get angry, you know, I'm not going to raise my fist against them. We all have certain sense of boundaries we have. So basically, distancing, we can beginning begin with that which is unacceptable for us. So I myself should feel this is this is something that I should not be doing. Not that. See, there are many things which we intellectually understand I should not be doing. Hmm? But our mind that is not such a big deal. Uh, uh, they may, it may be a big deal, but with those it's difficult to distance ourselves. So if we look at our own behavior, maybe last one week, last one month, which was the action that we did which shocked us. Hey, I should not have been doing this. Hmm? I should not have spoken like that. I should not have done like this. Maybe I should not have lied like that. Maybe I should not have done that. So whatever it is. So then that can be the parameter for us to start. This is not me. This is not who I want to be. But if I keep doing this, this is what I will end up with. Because the samskaras work at the conscious level. So find out what is unacceptable and create a distance from that. So it's like if we consider like a parent, a, a child and a parent, that's a very good metaphor. See, this concept of inner distancing, it's possible if we have some daily introspection time. Even if we spend some five minutes, I have a whole seminar series on journaling. So in journaling, I recommend just we can write four things. What was the best thing? What is the worst thing? 
So the best and the worst of what I did and what happened. So in the last 24 hours, what are the best thing I did? What are the best thing that happened to me? What are the worst thing that I did? What are the worst thing that happened to me? Now by this what happens is that we start thinking about ourselves. And then not just what, but also why. Why do I think this was the best thing that I did? Say, you know, I had an opportunity to overeat, but I didn't overeat. Now for some people it may be very important. You know, why, why is this important? Why do I feel that oh, this was a good thing that I did? This was the best thing I did. Because I have a tendency to overeat. Maybe I was disturbed. In the past, whenever I was disturbed by something, my tendency would be to overeat. This time I didn't overeat. So, having some daily time to observe ourselves. That can help us to get a perspective. So it's just like when we want to know people, we spend time with them. So we spend time with them, that means we talk with them, we try to understand them. See, we also need to spend time with ourselves. We are always doing things, but we need to, in one sense, get to know ourselves better. Get to know ourselves and get to know our samskaras. Samskaras can be positive also. See, if I feel this is a bad thing, I did. Why do I feel this is a bad thing? Because it goes against some samskara, isn't it? So, okay, this, these are good impressions of the women, which, are, which can be my aids. So, have some time for introspection. Try to find out what is unacceptable for this. What is the worst thing that I did? And gradually by that, the distance will happen. Say for example, yesterday, you know, if, if at the end of the day I come and you know, I have had so many things to do in the college or workplace, and I come to the wise and then somebody already comes and tells you, know, oh, this is not done, do this, this is not done, this is done. Say, I'm already, I want to relax for some time. Why is this person getting on my case in chief? So if I observe that, like many devotees, Gras, the couple will be there. I come back from my office to home and I just want to relax. And my wife wants to talk with me. She said, this happened, that happened, that happened. And I find that I just get irritated. So then I told the devotee, that, we, you understand that's a different role you are playing. So if you need some time to relax, don't expect that you move your home and relax. You know, if you are coming back in your car, Maybe park your car somewhere. If you need to do some hearing, five, ten minutes, you can do some chanting, do some praying, hearing some kirtan, do something which will rejuvenate you. And then come back. You have to recover your strength. And then you can face the situation. So it's like if we observe some patterns in where we tend to get provoked, then we can address those patterns. So I think self that self-observation requires time. So introspection, I mean just five minutes every day, spending is very helpful. Now as far as changing the impressions within us, that is, I don't think bhakti is just diversion. Diversion is one aspect to it. But I prefer, I mean that it's, it's multiple things. It's bhakti, sometimes we divert our mind from temptations, but it is that's, that's, I prefer the word redirection rather than diversion. It's diversion means it's already a path is there and I'm going on the diversion. But redirection is what we are doing it. But it's not just the redirection, it's reformation. We are not just directing our mind in different directions, we are forming new impressions in the mind. So now we can say redirection will create reformation, that is true. Bhakti is much deeper than redirection. So how do we do that? You know, we have to find out our particular interests in Bhakti. So if these are, this is Bhakti is the circle of Bhakti. That means you get the things that are good for us. And these are things that feel good for us. So we need to find the intersection between the two ones. Say for example, if I find Japa very difficult, if Japa requires a lot of strength, and then I'm already feeling exhausted, I think, okay, chant and you'll feel strong. No, I won't feel strong at that. Chanting is important, but maybe a Tatan Kirtan can help. If I'm more intellectual, 
we may be hearing some class, or not just hearing some random class. Hearing some class we already liked, or maybe some passage from a class I can cut it and keep it in my phone. We write down some notes, we read out those notes. So we have to find out what our particular somehow is, and then, uh, then we do that. Then go to one temple. I went there, and it's under this. A devotee, a devotee, no, it was not a temple, a devotee's house. It was a devotee's house, and I saw they had put like five, almost 500 cookies. So I said, Do you have any program? So that devotee told me, No, he says, My wife for her cooking is a stress reliever. So he says, He's stress cooking. So she likes cooking, and cooking for Krishna. So he says, whenever she gets stressed, everybody gets with three cookies. <laughs> and so I thought it was a very wonderful way of redirecting the stress. So she likes cooking naturally. She feels comforted. She feels that basically everybody needs the feeling that I can do something of value. Life can be so discouraging. This went wrong, I made this mistake, this happened, that happened. So for that, I talked with that mother afterwards, and she said that whenever I cook, I feel that I'm doing something of value for someone. You know, people take the take the food, they feel happy. So everybody has to find out. We have to be creative in our own. I'm not saying that we give up our sadhana or our sadhana, certainly not. But when we are feeling down, each of us has to take responsibility to find out how I can raise myself. Okay. Thank you, Chris. So just a small follow-up on this. So, uh, this uh, introspection can help me what I really feel about and can I actually then predict my behavior because of some uh, something which I assume and then can you actually uh, like, uh, predict and uh, then work upon it, then uh, consciously remember, okay, this I did before and now See, introspection is the whole big subject. I have a whole, in my journaling, I talk about what are the purpose of introspection. First is preparation. It's like, if if we are going on, a, if we are in an army, and we know this is the place where the terrorists are likely to attack, this is the place where the enemy is likely to attack. So we are more prepared over there. So by introspection, we ourselves understand where in which times we are more vulnerable. Generally they say, what is that acronym? Halt. Most people fall to temptation when they are hungry, angry, lonely or tired. So, now, like while earlier said, it's not so much, let's say, if somebody drinks, somebody watches porn. It's not so much because drinking is so attractive or it's like porn is so seductive. It can be, but it's not that. It's quite often that I said the emotions are unbearable. So I'm hungry, but I don't have some food to eat or I don't think about that food. If I'm angry about something, if I'm lonely, if I'm tired, I just need a nap over there. But instead, spend hours doing something else. So we, we try to assert, understand our own patterns. When do I do some things? So preparation is the first thing that happens. Then, after once we have preparation, preparation. These are the situations when I, I can actually I, I tend to go wrong. Then after that is purification. Purification means what can I do at that time? What are the resources for me to change the content of my mind? Purification, preparation is when am I provoked, when am I agitated. Hmm? Preparing, purification means how can I change the contents of my mind. So we may say remembering Krishna purifies us. Okay, that's true. But which ways can I remember Krishna? So I need to have those resources available for me. So it helps us in preparation, it helps us in purification, 
And then eventually, it also helps us in pacification. So you know, purification means basically I'm changing the contents of the mind, but purification is what I mentioned is, how can I redirect my mind? Like a child is crying, the mother says, be peaceful, be peaceful. No, mother just gives a toy to the child, as the toy makes some noise, the child starts making noise, the child forget it. That's where redirection. So this is more like purification is more like reformation of the mind. But pacification is more comes from the redirection of the mind. So we need both. So how can I pacify my mind? When do I need to prepare myself? How can I pacify myself? How can I purify myself? All this can come to introspection. Yes, please. So we, like, uh, nowadays in the technology world, we see artificial intelligence is very popular. So uh, recently I was going through a blog where uh, the company is built that PPT. Uh, the open air uh, that has developed uh, artificial neurons which can be installed in the brain and with that uh, like the person will be able to operate machines without his uh, doing anything like with his brain he can control and uh, like uh, they are predicting that by 2029 like in uh, four five years it will become a usual thing and they will and hence the power of mind one million times and like the person will be able to speak any language and he will be able to detect any disease within his body with the help of artificial intelligence installed within the brain. So uh, with this we understand that uh, body and mind like are very closely connected. Um, so can this affect emotions or uh, even the modes of the person if these kind of manipulations happen in the body. What all AI can do and what all AI can't do, to that boundary can seem at times a bit fuzzy. But broadly, there is information processing. Now, AI can do phenomenal level of information processing. And as AI develops, it can become a resource for us. By information processing, I mean, like you said, thinking different languages, doing maths, finding information. But eventually, we don't just need information processing. We need value judgments in our life. Value judgment means which is more important, which is less important. Now, AI can be used for writing stories. Now, People are writing obscene stories using AI. So people can create misinformation using AI. They water that, or the deep fakes. You can create that. So ultimately, the power of discernment has to come from the human mind. Now, it can come from the minds of the AI designers, and that can come forward. So can it change the modes? Ultimately, it is human conscious, consciousness which will be deciding how the AI can be used. Or do we really want that uh, some person out there somewhere should control how we use our mind? That's why in the Western world, we practically never use the word mind control. Because in India or in traditional societies, mind control means we control our mind. That's the understanding. But in the West, mind control means someone else is controlling your mind. That's the connotation. And that's what? Uh, that's how, how cults occur. That's how brainwashing occurs. That's how indoctrination occurs. So, all those kind of chips, there are a lot of ethical issues, whether they should be installed. And I think there are many ethical, AI will have to have deal with, or rather, as AI develops, we'll have to seriously deal with the ethical side of how, what, to what extent it should be used. But ultimately, AI can't change the samskaras in our mind. It is we who will have to use AI. It's, uh, now say, internet, almost, depending on search, which service you take, but it's almost 50 to 75 percent of internet search is about obscenity and porn. Now, can AI change that? Can AI change the, AI can provide information very easily to people, but can AI change which information people seek? AI can help people to speak in various languages. 
But can AI control what people speak in those languages? AI can create its own filters. But once we have AI creating filters, then it is not self-control, isn't it? It is somebody else controlling us. So, that is a problem. I don't think ever technology can replace the human need, the need for humans to actually become more disciplined. In fact, Carl Jung was a Western psychologist. He said, the more outer power we get, the more inner power we need. Like say, 100 years ago, if somebody, now the lust is there in everyone. And people want to see things which trigger their lust. That's just not normal human urge. But say 100 years ago, or even 50 years ago, before the internet became widespread, or 25 years ago, 30, 30 years ago, whatever you want to say. People would have to get physical books with, print, with very clear images, expensive color books, if they wanted to see something else. Now, today, in 15 minutes, a person can see person can see more obscene imagery than what a person could see previously in 50 years, even with having a lot of wealth. Isn't it? So all that it means is that the outer power has increased. And that's why we need more and more inner power. So technology can never provide inner power to us. Technology can increase our outer power. It is for us. That's why as technology increases, we may need spirituality even more. So that our technology increases our outer power, spirituality increases our inner power. And then technology can be used more responsibly. Platform, we see that we are contesting against our two stars. And we want to say that we are slowing down our bhakti. It is slowing down our bhakti. It is commenced. Slowing down. It is slowing down our bhakti. What is slowing down? We are persisting. We are persisting to distance between mind and soul. Then we can use the time for purpose. That's a horrible idea. It's, it's, it's escapism. Okay. Because the mind is a thing in itself. Say, if my hand is fractured, and instead of going to a doctor and putting my hand in the sling, I'll say, I'll just use the same hand to chant Hare Krishna. Chanting Hare Krishna is wonderful, but chanting Hare Krishna is not going to heal the fracture. Okay. So, just as the hand needs its own treatment, the mind needs its own treatment. Now, it depends on what kind of samskaras are there. To think that spirituality is like one solution for every problem with the mind, that's a terrible idea. It causes huge problems. Is spirituality the ultimate solution? Of course. But is it necessarily the immediate solution? Is it necessarily the intermediate solution? Maybe, maybe not. It depends. It, what kind of samskaras are there in a person's mind? They, for example, I know two devotees in America, both of them were in the American Army. They had gone to Iran, Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. So many of these people have got PTSD. You heard of PTSD? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Basically, you know, they saw right in front of them, one of those were, he was sitting, and right in, next to him, there was like somebody shot and his he was the his colleague was driving the car and tuck, the bullet came and his head smashed up and the blood splattered on his face. So this is from that time. Now when you say in movies this all this thing is like very it's what is like the horror scenes are entertaining sometimes. R rated movies are there for that. But in real life, after that what happens is like he was anytime he hears a loud sound, just so overwhelmed. So now, for him, he told me that even Kirtan's loud sound, I can't hear it. I just like there, the, we have this vampers. Vampers, that I mean, soft kartal is fine, but vampers, I just can't hear it. 
Now, can you just tell him, here more to and it will go. But it will be torture for him in that time. So, can Bhakti help us heal it? Of course it can, ultimately. But we should, I see, we don't have to reduce Bhakti to only a set of activities. Bhakti ultimately is serving Krishna. Bhakti ultimately is developing our relationship with Krishna. Bhakti ultimately is handling our body and mind in such a way that we can actually serve Krishna. So, if somebody finds that they have to do something specific to deal with their mind and the samskaras within the mind, and that's, that may be required. Different samskaras may need to be dealt in different ways. Some samskaras, they can just be dealt with by just override them and they go away. It's like desires are also of different kinds. They sometimes, if I pass by a shop or if I pass by a place where say some sort of property is being sold, I think oh, I want to eat it. It's a circumstantial desire. But there will be a deep rooted desire. You know, I love some properties. You know, I, if I go to a particular place, where, where do you get it? I will want to go there and buy it and get it. So different desires are of different degrees. And different desires need to be dealt in different ways. When Ravan went to Lanka, sorry, Hanuman went to Lanka, there are different obstacles. And different obstacles signify different things. So when he came to Lankini, he just slapped Lankini, she fell on the side and then he went inside. But before he came to Lankini, there was Simvika. And what was Simvika doing? She from below had just trapped him. So he just couldn't do anything at that time. So what he did was, she was trying to pull him and she was trying to use all her force. He preempted that and he himself rushed into her mouth. And he went into her belly and then from inside the belly, he burst it apart and he came out. So similarly, for dealing with our material diversions, some are like Lankini, out of sight is out of mind. That just practice bhakti, override the impressions, they go away. But some are like Simvika. We need to go inside them. What has caused this? What has caused this action? We have to analyze, we have to evaluate. And that may be required. And without doing that, chanting may not help, bhakti may not help. So rather than thinking that this is a waste of time, can just go analyzing and psycho going into one's mind be a waste of time? Of course it can be a waste of time. But is it always a waste of time? Not necessarily. So each individual has to take personal responsibility. How best can I serve Krishna? Or how best can I handle my body and mind so that I can serve Krishna? So for this, so one devotee, he actually had some soup. Superficial PTSD. This was the one devotee was he saw the skull smash in the But the other devotee, you know, he was at a particular place and just ahead of them there was another unit. And they just exploded. And the whole truck just blew up and everybody died. But he had just joined that new unit, he didn't know anyone in that unit. So although so he was shocked, he also felt, but for him he was not the trauma was not that important. He started chanting, his fear went away. But for the other devotee, or the other veteran from the army who became a devotee. He had to go through a whole therapy. So where in the therapy what happens is, like generally speaking, same principle of Vyasa and Vairagya can be applied, but it's a different way. Somebody's got a fracture, what do they do? First is put your hand in the sling. And then basically don't move your hand. For one week, two weeks, and after that, gradually start moving your hand. Gradually start moving your hand. So like that for somebody has PTSD initially, they are put in a protected environment where there are no loud noises for one or two weeks. And then after that, gradually they are exposed to noises. Sitting in a room and a marble falls from it. Marble is dropped from a table down. Okay, do are they affected? They are okay. Initially they are, afterwards they are not. Then you take a bigger like a tennis ball and drop. Then you take a, a heavier object which causes a louder noise and drop it. And gradually, they start. in their mind, basically, any sound they are associated with being children. So they have to change that. So, depending on the strength of conditioning, if some devotee has say, been addicted to something, this chanting Hare Krishna alone remove their addiction, well, rather than thinking that Chanting Hare Krishna alone is not removing. What we need to say is, how can this person develop their relationship with Krishna? And whatever is required, 
for developing the relationship with Krishna, that should be seen as bhakti. So we have in the West we have formed a BRG called Bhakti Recovery Group. So basically, it's like Alcoholics Anonymous is there. So devotees who have serious addiction issues, and especially it is not just addiction; they also have like codependence. Not codependence, what is? Um, yeah, codependence. That's the word. Basically, you know, the husband is addict, and the wife is also affected by that. So they have the spouse or the intimate partners. Or those, those who are caretakers of an addict, they also have formed a group, and they discuss. They discuss about Krishna. They discuss about the specific issues, and they they find their own combination for dealing with it. So each person has to anukulya se santalpa pratikulya se varchan. So we can't make one rule that all obstacles are like simbika, and each particular problem we have to go deep inside. We don't have that. If some obstacle is lumpy, we just push it aside and move forward. But we can't assume all obstacles are like lumpy. We can't assume all obstacles are like simika. We have to find out which obstacles are. And the same obstacle for one person may like simika, for another person it may like be like uh, be like uh, what is the word? Be like uh, lumpy. So it depends. Okay. That is, say, if I am here and I'm observing myself from above, I look at myself and I look backwards and look at what I did throughout the day. But if I am here and I'm looking from here, that means I'm feeling very down, and I start from here. This is healthy. This is not. If we are in tamas. Then trying to learn from the past in tamas doesn't work. From here we are learning from the past. Here we are lamenting the past. Here we are just losing ourselves in the past. That's not very healthy. So having some keeping ourselves satvik frame of mind is very helpful. Very not only helpful, it's essential. Otherwise, it's just an endless mental replay. You know, I'm such a foolish person. I did this. Why did I do that? I keep doing these things, and that's not very constructive at all. Okay. Any last question before we start? Want to add any comments? So, thank you very much for the thoughtful participation. I pray that whatever samskaras we all have, that we find. the healthy samskaras and we develop them and we find means to deal with our healthy samskaras so that gradually we can go beyond them thank you very much shri krishna bhagwan ki shri the prabhupad ki shri the bhagavad gita ki gaur bhakta prind ki tayo nitya